Chapter 3 Orwell's 1984 Horror or Hope When George Orwell wrote 1984, he saw from the vantage of 1948 a new world already in process of development around him and implicit in all the presuppositions which governed his day. For Orwell, 1984 is 1948 more openly revealed. That Orwell viewed this scientific socialist future with horror is well known and obvious. That 1984 became a symbol of a monstrous and dehumanized world is equally obvious. It comes as a surprise to many that the term 1984 is often used as a symbol of a glorious future, despite full awareness of the meaning of Orwell's work. Thus, a major periodical cites 1984. As the symbolic dates when man has overcome death. More importantly, the New Scientist carried a series of articles on 1984, published in two volumes as The World in 1984. These articles give almost unanimously, with a professor of poetry markedly dissenting, a glowing picture of 1984. Why should 1984, the ultimate horror for Orwell, Represents the beginning of ultimate bliss for so many scientists. Why should they even invite comparison to Orwell's vision by using 1984 as their symbolic did? The answer is that for them, Orwell's disenchantment with the brave new world of science revealed strong elements of utopianism in his thinking. Orwell did not renounce socialism, he only feared what he believed in. Van Rijksen has rightly observed that, quote, What is tragic in Orwell is that he does not himself know what to defend in opposition to this tyranny. He has nothing with which to oppose it, as he lacks a position of his own. In this, he is like the party. His conception is that of a negative freedom, a freedom from tyranny, culminating in a sensual, normless love for Julia. Orwell can oppose a nihilism of freedom. The nihilism of Sartre. Therefore, he cannot stand firm in his freedom. Galatians 5 1. His freedom is based on his own power, existing solely because of himself, and consequently readily destroyed when his own life is at stake. End quote. Orwell did not hold to Christian ethics. He could only briefly oppose amoral freedom to amoral power. His utopianism. Was his failure to overcome an ethical repugnance to a moral power. He judged 1984 by a Christian ethical horror he could not believe in. For the scientists who visualized a glorious era in 1984, the only admissible ethics were pragmatic. According to one social scientist who believes that science can save us, quote, Ethical norms will change in the future as they have in the past, and human institutions, including the church, will accommodate themselves to change in the future as in the past. A developed social science will greatly facilitate this adjustment because, through science, man can secure a very much more adequate knowledge of the consequences of different types of conduct. Instead of relying upon ancient and arbitrary authority for this counsel, end quote. The implication is clear. There are no absolute ethics. Nothing is right or wrong in any ultimate sense, but only in a practical sense in terms of consequences, to use Lundberg's criterion. Orwell's horror was unscientific because if there is no absolute truth, there is no absolute evil. As a result, 1984 is an attractive concept to such scientists. Because it provides greater scope for scientific experimentation and planning. The premises of such thinking are evolutionary. The evolutionary concept presupposes and requires several important ideas and conclusions. First of all, God is either bypassed or denied. For all forms of evolutionary thinking, God is irrelevant. If he exists, he has nothing essential to do with a world which has evolved out of its own inner forces. And thus is a law unto itself. The God hypothesis is thus only retained by persons who are trying to maintain a formal but non essential relationship between Christianity and evolution. 
For the consistent evolutionist, the energy inherent in the material universe is seen as sufficient cause for the development and proliferation of life and being. The God hypothesis is irrelevant. Man's need for it is psychological, since he does not yet control all aspects of life. When he establishes that control, he will discard such a belief, and quote, Belief is simply an emotional identification with a concept, and as such is not open to question or challenge. End quote. Quote, the recognition that man's brain has apparently unlimited capabilities and that the horizons of human culture cannot yet be perceived is not to deny his need for a belief in some super-organic being. Until we have established direct control over all aspects of life and have come to accept the inevitability of organic death, we apparently must turn, as have all men in the past, to some concept of divine supremacy. End quote. When man has, quote, established direct control over all aspects of life, end quote, then this psychological necessity for, quote, some concept of divine supremacy, end quote, decided by, quote, each individual according to his emotional and intellectual requirements, end quote, will disappear. For man will be his own god, his own source of total control. Meanwhile, God is only psychologically and not metaphysically real to man. He exists as a need, not as God. Second, because there is no God, there is no ultimately true law, no absolute concept of right and wrong. No God means no law, and no law means that nothing is a crime, and hence all acts are equally valid in terms of morality, although perhaps not equally practical or workable. In this sense, honesty can be the best policy if it works best, but dishonesty can also be the best policy wherever it works better than honesty. Third, by dropping the God concept, the idea of good and evil as ultimate moral concepts is also dropped. Nothing is good or evil of itself, and the very terms good and evil reflect an older, quote, obsolete, end quote, world of absolutes, of God's truth and law, Good and truth are whatever works, whatever serves man's purposes. Man is not under law, but over law. Therefore man cannot be judged as good or evil, but man judges things to be good or evil, useful or useless, as they serve him. Scientific, humanistic man is beyond good and evil. Good and evil are alike mythological concepts. Thus, man cannot be evil. Therefore, the world planners of 1984 cannot do evil because evil does not exist. There are merely successful experiments in human engineering and unsuccessful ones. Fourth, as is now clear, because God is a myth, the evolutionary and empirical approach to man's problems must be, quote, scientific, end quote, that is, experimental, and man is thus the prime laboratory test animal. Experimentation with man is already in process. The, quote, biological revolution claims that it soon can alter man's hereditary as well as transplant organs. The mind of man is to be controlled by psychiatry through chemistry and electronics. Man's health is being socially treated by the fluoridation of water and now, quote, contraceptivizing, end quote, the water to affect birth control and then allowing women to conceive by taking a, quote, neutralizing agent, end quote, to offset the effect of the water has been seriously proposed. Another scientist has proposed deep freezing the dying and rejuvenating them at a later date when their particular ailment has been overcome. Man can, in this way, be kept alive until immortality is achieved. Until then, we shall have what he terms, quote, the freezer-centered society, end quote, the list can be greatly extended. It is sufficient to note that man is now the prime guinea pig of the scientific planners. Fifth, every experiment, to be valid, requires total control of all factors. Hence, the scientific society must be fully totalitarian, otherwise it will not work, nor will it be scientific. 
science, according to Tietjev, proceeds on the faith that, quote, all phenomena that are presently unknown to humans will someday be brought into the sphere of the known, and that when this happens, more and more things will be made subject to the law of controlled causation, end quote. The, quote, law of controlled causation, end quote, is basic to science. Quote, Simple knowledge of cause and effect relationships may not in itself lead to greater reliance on science than on supernaturalism. What is much more likely to prove effective is based on the law of controlled causation. Whenever men are able to demonstrate that they can produce stated effects by manipulating their causes, the phenomena with which they deal move from the realm of religion to the realm of science. Thus, as more facts become scientifically known, the law of controlled causation covers ever more cases, then man's reliance on the supernatural shrinks. This is merely another way of saying that as the amount of knowledge in a society goes up, there is a proportionate decrease of its dependence on supernaturalism. To test the validity of this hypothesis, one has only to note that genuine reliance on the supernatural remains strongest in sophisticated societies in precisely those areas, like death, where the law of controlled causation cannot be said to operate, end quote. In terms of this evolutionary perspective, science is not so much the understanding of things as the controlling of things. The government and providence of God are replaced by the government and providence of man, and the divine predestination gives way to predestination by scientific planners. A Christian society, by leaving predestination to God, leaves man in liberty and denies the right of independent control to any human agency. All human powers and authorities are carefully governed and circumscribed by the word of God. A scientific society, in order to be scientific, must bring all things under the strict control of scientists so that, by means of the law of controlled causation, the desired results can be socially and individually attained. By means of science, man's needs are to be realised. In terms of evolutionary science, man's needs are humanistic. According to Alexander Robertus Todd, Professor of Organic Chemistry at the University of Cambridge, a life peer and Nobel Prize recipient for chemistry in 1957, the goals of mankind are, quote, freedom from hunger and want, adequate warmth and protection, and freedom from disease, end quote. The scientist, by his ability to affect desired results through scientific controls, is best able to give man what man seeks. Moreover, Isidot Isaac Rabi, Associate Director of Radiation Laboratory of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Chairman of the General Advisory Committee to the Atomic Energy Commission, Higgins Professor of Physics at Columbia University, member of the President's Science Advisory Committee and Nobel Prize recipient for physics in 1944, assures us with all the wisdom of his position that, quote, somehow the scientific education diminishes the ambition for power and worldly influence, end quote. Rabbi thus believes that we can trust the scientists to be disinterestedly concerned with man's destinies because of, quote, a feeling for the possibilities of development or evolution in a current situation, end quote, and, quote, a certain sense of rightness and equity, sometimes naive but rarely on the wrong track, end quote. Joshua Lederberg observed that after eons of evolution, quote, by random chemistry, end quote, quote, our culture is achieving knowledge and control of its biological instruments that are capable of purposefully altering them, end quote. Lederberg made some predictions about areas of control which he believed were soon to come. Quote, 1. The successful transplantation of vital organs, heart, liver, limbs. The technical barriers will be overcome long before we can reach a moral consensus on the organisation of the market for allocation of precious parts. 2. Artificial prosthetic organs. Unfortunately not yet being developed, with the necessary vigour to overtake the proceeding. 3. In consequence of these, and probably other advances in, say, protein biochemistry, a sudden increase in the expectation or prolongability of life. 
With a wider range of technical resources will come a corresponding expansion of the scale of the useful cost of maintaining a given personality, whatever our humanitarian predilections. Discrepancies in the availability of these resources must widen. 4. More optimistically, the modification of the developing human brain through treatment of the fetus or infant. At least some modifications, like those used primitively now in the control of metabolic diseases, can be expected to be constructively applied to normal children and might well exceed the present bounds of genetic and developmental variations. 5. Clonal reproduction through nuclear transplantation. The prototype for this suggestion is the transplantation of a nucleus from an adult tissue back into an amphibian egg from which the natural nucleus has been removed with sometimes normal development of this egg. It should be recalled that vegetative reproduction occasionally concealed under outward trappings of sexuality is an important feature of the plant world and a few primitive animals. The experiments has yet to be attempted in a mammal. Apart from its place in the narcissistic perpetuation of a given genotype, the technique would have an enormous impact on predetermination of sex, on the avoidance of hereditary abnormalities, as well as positive genetics or cultural acceleration through education within a clone, and on more far-reaching experiments on the reconstruction of the human genotype. End quote. Lederberg's predictions are commonplace among scientists today. Thus, the biologist Dr. James Bonner of the California Institute of Technology at a meeting of the Pacific Division of the Association for the Advancement of Science made even more far-reaching statements. Quote, New discoveries in controlling living cells are leading to staggering possibilities. You soon can grow a new heart or four hands or bigger brain. A synthetic man is a distinct possibility. Bonner was summing up his latest research with living cells, research that made him further predict in an interview, one, new organs, heart, lungs, arms, legs, not transplants, but new tissue grown by each individual as the need arises after disease or accident. Two, bigger brains with better learning capacity. Vital, he believes, if men are not to be made obsolete by computers. Bonner says the growth of new organs will be possible, quote, in less than a generation, end quote. Quote, my son will be able to have four hands, and he might need them to keep up with the pace of our changing world, end quote. Bonner says, he adds wistfully, quote, but it probably won't come in my time, end quote. Bonner is 54. His son James is 15. Growth of bigger brains, he believes, is, quote, somewhat further away. We don't know as much about the brain as we do the body, but it is coming, end quote. Quote, we're not far from the time when we can take a cell, any cell, and tell it to become an embryo or heart tissue or bone or something else. Quote, we are learning how to turn on the genes in the nucleus which tell a cell to become one thing and to turn off the genes which tell it to become something else. End quote, end quote. Not only will man be the object of scientific control and development, but nature also will be controlled. François Bouillier believes that 1984 will mean the end of, quote, untamed nature, end quote, for, quote, the world of 1984 will certainly leave but little place for wild animals, end quote. Quote, herbicides and insecticides will lead to a total monopoly of man on plant and animal productivity, end quote. All productive areas will be used for scientific farming and competing life will be killed by herbicides and insecticides. Quote, All wildlife will in such activities certainly be considered as competitive with man and therefore destined to extermination. End quote. Only, quote, a few natural preserves, end quote, will be retained, quote, for scientific or aesthetic reasons, end quote. The use of herbicides and scientific farming are seen as basic to scientific agriculture by Sir William Slater and Professor Koichi Yamada. Weather will be controlled and hurricanes will disappear. The California coast will have a new climate with an established temperature. The state will construct, quote, offshore islands and bars 
breakwaters, lagoons, and small curving bays, end quote. The length of the shoreline is to be tripled. Foods also will be products of science, although not as early as 1984. Quote, of course, it is conceivable that by 1984 we shall produce our food in factories without animals or plants, exploiting the most far-reaching biological discovery of the last few years, the synthesis of proteins in cell-free systems. Eventually, we should be able to manufacture satisfactory foodstuffs in great chemical plants, where masses of ribosomes would be supplied with synthetic amino acids and long-lived messenger RNAs with energy-yielding phosphates produced by irradiating chloroplasts with laser-tuned light of the most effective wavelength. But that technological dream is nearer 50 than 20 years ahead, unless resources are put into these lines of research at something like the level that was used to develop the atom bomb. In 1984, we will probably still be depending on more or less conventional agriculture. End quote. Other possibilities cited are environmental control, snow, quote, melted before it sticks to the ground, end quote, and, quote, an air conditioning shed erected over the entire community, end quote. The mountains built, quote, on a firmer flat plain, end quote, by bulldozers. In this brave new world, scientists will, of course, be the peacemakers. Scientists will also, quote, have achieved their major goal, the drafting and general acceptance of a new system of education based on the ideals of fundamental common interests of the human species, and on the development of a sense of belonging to mankind as a whole, end quote. The results of this education will be world government, quote. Thus, by the end of the century, when the generation brought up in this new spirit will take over, the establishment of a world authority will follow as a matter of course, end quote. Crime will also be taken care of by the scientists. We are told that, quote, in any increasingly competitive society, we must expect rising figures of crime, end quote. Moreover, not only a competitive society, but also a Christian one perpetuates crime. Quote, the risk of criminality will be enhanced too if the present association between moral teaching and the Christian religion is perpetuated. End quote. Morality must be, we are warned, disassociated from the supernatural to avoid a moral breakdown. Quote, Indeed, our present failure in a scientific age to disassociate morality from remarkably improbable dogmas must be counted as one of the most vulnerable features of contemporary society. If the next 20 years does not see general recognition of a purely secular morality, we must not be surprised to find that moral standards have been emptied away along with the Christian bathwater. End quote. What kind of morality did Wooten have in mind? First of all, the social scientist would replace the traditional law court and transform it, quote, into social agencies for the prevention of crime, end quote. Morality is thus in essence the scientific totalitarian state. In the area of sexuality, the new morality, or old sin, would and indeed does prevail, quote, by 1984, the practice of adult homosexuality will surely have ceased to be criminal, and only the deeply religious will be shocked by premarital unchastity. Concern for a child's welfare will have finally swamped considerations of its parents' marital state, and divorce by consent, after how many years of marriage, will be attainable legally, not as now only by subterfuge and perjury. Conceivably also, the sane and humane values of many intelligent young people who have shown that they prefer Alderson marching to rat racing will have had a more profound influence upon our whole way of life than some of their faint-hearted elders can yet envisage. End quote. Man's economic outlook would no longer be, quote, the forms of an ancient economy of scarcity which was his heritage for five millennia, end quote, but rather the sense of his own capacity to create and remake the world. This confidence concerning the future is commonplace in scientific literature. Colonization of the universe is seriously discussed. Shock and sadness are expressed that Venus and Mars apparently do not support life. 
Ronald L. Bracewell, director of Stanford Radio Astronomy Institute, believes that, quote, intelligent beings may be transmitting radio messages between the planets in outer space, but unfortunately, quote, we aren't tuned in, end quote, end quote. We are also assured that, in the age of automation and bionics, quote, the science of systems which function after the manner of, or in a manner characteristic of, or resembling living systems, end quote, quote, a machine might grow replacement parts to alter its own circuitry, end quote. Quote, it's also within the bounds of future possibility to build a highly complex machine that is quite capable of building, reproducing, similar machines whenever the situation demands, end quote. But this is not all. Even more amazing things are planned for man and are the subjects of recent experimentation. Quote, Transplanting of memory from one brain to another by injection was disclosed yesterday by a group of psychologists at the University of California at Los Angeles. The experiment was made with rats, but Dr. Alan L. Jacobson said, quote, We can certainly imagine that benefits might result for humans in the long run, end quote. Jacobson, assistant professor of psychology, said the transplanted substance was ribonucleic acid, RNA, long suspected to be involved in the memory process. The RNA molecule is similar to that of the oxoribonucleic acid, DNA, the molecule that carries hereditary blueprints from one generation to the next. Current theory is that RNA may encode memory, much as DNA encodes genetic information. Jacobson and his associates trained rats to go to a food when a certain click was sounded, they extracted RNA from the brains of the trained rats and injected it into the bodies of untrained rats. The injected rats showed a, quote, significant tendency, end quote, 7 out of 25, to go to the cup when a click sounded. Without previous training, Jacobson said, a control group of uninjected rats responded in this manner only one time in 25, he said, end quote. The president of the American Chemical Society, Dr. Charles C. Price, quote, has proposed making the artificial creation of life a national goal, one that could be achieved in 20 years. End quote. But this is not all. A British astronomer has speculated on what man can do when the universe begins to die. Quote, if modern theories of creation are correct, the main body of stars was formed at the same time, and when the sun is dying, the entire universe will be filled with dead or dying stars. It is believed, however, that the process of star formation is still in progress, so that there may be some live stars with planets to colonize when this cosmic catastrophe takes place. Still another possibility would be to construct our own sun, a source of heat and light which might be suspended in the sky and hold the hovering demons of cold and darkness at bay. This artificial sun would operate by subatomic energy. In the remaining years of grace, man might learn how to run the carbon cycle. Hydrogen, the fuel, is abundant, and other light atoms, such as lithium, are also plentiful sources of energy. With several billions of years of time at his disposal for research, man should be able to develop cheap, abundant, and manageable subatomic power. End quote. Against this boundless scientific optimism, a few scientific voices are raised. Professor Zenon Bach, Professor of Physiotherapy and Radiobiology in the University of Liège, Belgium, raises the question, quote, What is going to happen when the natural equilibrium between man and viruses is disturbed? End quote. Quote, Temporary sterilization of men, end quote, he states, is contemplated, and quote, Sterilizing substances are already present in chickens and beef offered for human consumption. Misfortunes of two kinds may be predicted, somatic troubles affecting only the individual and genetic troubles affecting the species, end quote. Moreover, quote, the development of the so-called diseases of civilization seem unavoidable. It will lead not only to endless troubles for medical men in research and practice, but also to psychological and legal complications. Let us take just one case. The control by drugs of reproduction and sexual activity is spreading because it is needed in order to limit the accelerated growth of the human population on the earth. 
Beyond the estimated number of 6 billion for the year 2000, great troubles must be expected. For the sake of more food, the use of insecticides, fungicides and artificial fertilizers is going to spread and intensify itself in all countries, with the consequence that concentrations of these substances in the water and food may increase up to the danger point. The great luxuries will be pure water from a spring, plants and animals carefully raised by the consumer himself in the absence of chemical contamination, fish caught in the high seas away from the coast. Thanks to increasing leisure, men, at least the most active of them, will feel the necessity to become agricultural workers again. End quote. In confirmation of Bach's fears, recent studies indicate the contamination of the air of the entire world and of rainfall. Quote, insecticides in air. British scientists have found traces of various insecticides, including DDT and dieldrin, in rainwater, implying that the atmosphere is now contaminated by them. Airborne insecticides may account for the recent discovery of DDT in the fat and liver of Antarctic seals and penguins. One British scientific committee described the situation as, quote, somewhat terrifying, end quote, end quote. It is interesting to note the comments of the editor of New Scientist in response to Bach's doubts. Zenon Bach, we are told, quote, is 60, end quote. The poor man is apparently too old to have any vision. It is not that scientists are unaware of the dangers. Asimov has noted, quote, Already the United States has stored millions of gallons of radioactive liquid underground. Both the United States and Great Britain have dumped concrete containers of fission products at sea. There have been proposals to drop the radioactive wastes in ocean abysses, to store them in old salt mines, to incarcerate them in molten glass and bury the solidified material. But there is always the nervous thought that in one way or another, the radioactivity will escape in time and contaminate the soil or the seas. One particularly haunting nightmare is the possibility that a nuclear-powered ship might be wrecked and spill its accumulated fission products into the ocean. End quote. No one, however, is sufficiently alarmed to call a halt to this increasing contamination of air, earth and water. The general confidence is that, when a crisis arises, science will come up with an answer. Meanwhile, more important tasks await, such as the Mars Project, an attempt to demonstrate the evolutionary process by an exploration of Mars. The official purposes of this project are to, quote, 1. Detect life. 2. Characterize the life forms detected. 3. Determine if such life has a common origin with life on Earth. This includes both the intertransfer of life between Earth and Mars and a common chemical evolution. 4. Establish the evolutionary pathway of Martian life. 5. Determine the interaction of life forms with the environment. 6. Look for fossil life, and if only fossils are found, determine the factors associated with the extinction of life. 7. If life is not found, discover the factors which prevented its development. End quote. Earlier, Lundberg's belief that science can save us was noted and examined. Knight's summary of Lundberg's faith is of interest. Quote, In summary, Lundberg's scientism reduced logically to the following propositions. 1. Ends, motives, etc. are data merely. They present no problem for social science, hence no problem at all. 2. Scientific knowledge alone is required for the prediction and control of social events. And 3. The prediction and control of social events is all that is required for the solution of practical social problems, at least to the extent that this is possible. And we should add that, when all this is made generally known by a proper scientific education, men will be content with what is possible, so that, in the crucial sense, the social problem will be solved by the application of scientific method. End quote. We saw earlier that the basic syllogism of the evolutionary position is simply this. No God means no law. No law means no crime. No crime means that anything goes. For the ordinary man, this means a license to sexuality of every variety he chooses. 
For the scientific planners, this means that man is the new god of being. The attributes of god, sovereignty, prediction and control, are all claimed by Lundberg for the scientific and especially the social scientist. The necessary premise of any true theology is simply this, quote, With god, all things are possible, end quote, Matthew 19.26. It follows, therefore, that if man be the new god of being, then with man all things are possible, that is, with the scientific planning man. This assurance of unlimited possibilities is basic to the perspective of evolutionary science. There is no humility, because it is unnecessary for a god to be humble. The biblical god is rendered an unnecessary and useless hypothesis, it is believed, since the scientist progressively predicts and controls events and, through the law of control causation, reduces to nothingness those areas of life over which man has no control. This control and prediction, however, will not be the property of all men, but of the scientific managers who will re-educate and remake man and even create life itself. Men will have a very near and highly experiment-prone God perpetually breathing down their necks, with no supernatural God as their supreme court and ground of liberty. Men are being steadily educated into this slavery by evolutionary science. Let us note what an editor has said of education. Quote, education is currently very widely held to be the great panacea for all ills, whether the problem be social, economic, international or physical, Education, we are told, is all that's needed. The trouble with the backward nations is that they, unfortunately, didn't have the educational opportunities the Western nations did. The juvenile delinquent and the underprivileged people alike are what they are for lack of education. Education is simply slavery. The essence of slavery is the loss of freedom of choice, being compelled to learn a new way of life. The essence of education, the process, is teaching the people a new way of life, a new set of values and goals, a set of ideas which he did not choose to have before. Quote, We've got to teach them a lesson, end quote, as usually meant the intention of applying force and pain to change the value judgments of an opposing group. Education, in other words, now in the language to be taught, is a passive verb, while to teach is active. Briefly, Education may be a panacea, but the process of applying it does, in actuality, involve enslaving the pupils. That's why war has, down through the ages, led to so much intellectual and social progress. It's highly educational. The panacea men have sought for curing the problems of interhuman conflicts down through the ages have all been forms of education. Quote, teaching them a lesson, end quote, or simply direct enslavement. Sure, education is slavery, but that just represents the fact that nothing, not even slavery, is inherently evil or destructive. End quote. We can agree that education apart from God is enslavement, because then education refuses to keep its appointed place and seeks to remake man in the image of his planned society. Christian education must respect the image of God in man and can only seek to conform the student to the requirements of the new man, Jesus Christ, who is, quote, the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world, end quote, John 1, 9. Man seeks in 1984 this world of total controls when the scientific planner becomes the new god of a new world the world of 1984, however, is the old world of Satan, of the fall of man, of the temptation to, quote, be as God, knowing good and evil, end quote, Genesis 3.5. It is the old world of the Tower of Babel, perpetually doomed to confusion, destruction and scattering. It is the world of Babylon the Great, of Revelation, the pretension of man to create a paradise apart from God. It is no brave new world but instead the age-old doomed world of covenant-breaking man. This new Tower of Babel in process of construction seems terrifying and imposing, but its collapse and disintegration 
will be even more awesome and impressive. For, quote, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. End quote. Psalm 2 4. The world of the future shall be God's world, and man in that world shall be only what the predestinating power and control of God intend him to be. For, quote, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. End quote. Acts 15 18.